Hi everyone, welcome to this video where we're discussing what I would just call curve analysis. So in this video we're going to um, look at a little reference chart I made and talk our way through that, and then also work some example problems. So first things first, this is the example or the reference chart I made. So this is something that you should have memorized. You're not going to have access to this on an exam, but I thought it was a neat way to just organize the information. That if the value of your function is less than zero, that's just saying that the values are negative. If the values of your function are equal to zero, that shows you that your x point that gives you that, that's what we call a zero of your function. So no surprise there. Um, that should sound very familiar if you were um, in an algebra course where maybe you had polynomial functions and you were factoring the polynomials to find zeros of the polynomial function. And of course, if your values of your function are greater than zero, that means it's positive. No surprises in the first row. In the second row, what we're saying here is if the first derivative is less than zero, that means your function is decreasing over that interval, or at that point, you might say. And if a part, at a particular point, we find that your first derivative is equal to zero, that point is a critical point of your function. Okay. Then, if we find that your first derivative is greater than zero at a point, that means at that point, your function is increasing. So that's how you read the table. And to get into the juicier parts of concavity, if your second derivative at a point is less than zero, that means your function is concave down at that point. And if we find that your second derivative is equal to zero at a point, that means x might be an inflection point. Emphasis on the might be though, because like in the last video, we found there were some points where even though the second derivative was zero, it didn't really flip signs as you're going across. It didn't go from concave up to concave down, or concave down to concave up. And so in that case, we don't even call that an inflection point. But that's a good indication. If the second derivative is zero, that you're looking at something that might be an inflection point. Remember, an inflection point is just when your function goes from concave up to concave down, or goes from concave down to concave up. And then lastly, if your second derivative is greater than zero, that's an indication that at that point, your, fun your function is concave up. Okay, so that's how you read that table. Um, and then I also included on the same sort of reference sheet um, that a relative maximum occurs at a critical point where it's concave down. So a critical point where it's concave down looks like that. And a critical point where it's concave up will look like that. So that's where we find a relative minimum. Um, an inflection point is where your function changes from concave up to concave down. So if you have a concave up function, it maybe looks like this, but then if it changes to concave down, that point, that is your inflection point. At every inflection point, the second derivative is equal to zero. However, again, not every point where second derivative is equal to zero is an inflection point. A critical point is either going to be a relative maximum, relative minimum, or inflection point. So remember, critical point, that just means the second derivative is zero, or sorry, excuse me. The critical point is where the first derivative is equal to zero. And when the first derivative is equal to zero, that means you either have a relative minimum, relative maximum, or an inflection point. However, you'll also notice an inflection point does not have to occur at a critical point. So those can be different, they can be the same. Um, I know this is a lot, it's a lot to take in, it's a lot to memorize, but um, that's why I made the sheet to try to sort of organize the main points of the last few videos. Uh, and so you can, you can download this off the Canvas course homepage, um, really try to absorb it and understand it because this is, again, part of the stuff I expect you to have memorized for your midterm exam. So moving on to some example problems, where we're gonna analyze some curves. 
Uh, this question is asking where, or for what values of x, we find the absolute minimum values of this particular function, at least along the closed interval, where x is between negative 2 and 4, and when it's a closed interval, we're including negative 2 and we're including 4 in our, in our set. And so what I'm going to have to do is to find an absolute minimum is maybe start by trying to find the critical points. So to find critical points, we're going to take the first derivative. Um, and so this is my first derivative, isn't it? Uh, 3 times 2 is just 6. So this is 3x squared minus 6x. And then we set the first derivative equal to 0. So I can also factor out a 3x here, and then I'm left with x minus 2. And the values that give me a 0 are going to be x equals 0 and x equal 2. And so these are my critical points. That's how you find critical points. Is you take the first derivative and you set it equal to 0 and then you solve for x. Now, just because it's a critical point doesn't mean it's the absolute minimum. And so just, you know, thinking about this and being a little bit, you know, what do you call it, conscientious or, you know, trying to be aware of what we're doing here. Let's just go ahead and plug these values of x into our original function. And so if I let x be 0, this will be 0 cubed minus 3 times 0 squared plus 12. And if I plug in 2 into my original function, I get 2 cube, and 2 cube is going to be 8 minus 3 times 2 squared um, plus 12. So that's 8 minus 12 plus 12, so that's going to be 8. And let me just suggest that the critical points are showing you places where you would have a horizontal tangent, where the critical points are showing you places where you have uh, a derivative of zero. So if our curve maybe looks something like this, our critical points are going to show up and point us out these um, local maxes or local minimums. But if I'm looking at this function on a closed interval, there actually might be a point that's lower than the points we just found. So while these might be the critical points, and this might be a local min, there's a possibility to have another minimum that's not identified by the critical points if that minimum happens on one of these end points of the interval, either the, either the starting point of the interval or the end point of the interval, right? And so whenever you are looking at a function that is defined over a closed interval, definitely check the end points of the closed interval to see if those are maximum or minimum values. All right, so what does that look like? We're going to evaluate my function at negative 2, since that's the starting point of the interval. So that'll be negative 2 cubed minus 3 times negative 2 squared plus 12. So f evaluated at negative 2 is going to be 8, no, negative 8 minus 12 plus 12. So it's going to be negative 8. And then if I evaluate my function at the you know, end point of my interval, positive 4, this is going to be 4 cubed minus 3 times 4 squared plus 12. So in other words, it's going to be 64 minus what is 3 times 16 anyways. Uh, 48. 64 minus 48 plus 12. Plus 12. So 64 minus 36. Um, man, I'm, I'm really blanking on that. That's like 28, I think. Anyways, it's some relatively large positive number. And out of these, let me just circle my candidates and point them out to you. Who is in the running? To be the absolute minimum value. Uh, when x is equal to 0, I have the value 12. When x is equal to 2, I have the value 8. When x is equal to negative 2, I have the value negative 8. And when x equals positive 4, I have the value positive 28. So the absolute minimum value of my function among these candidates seems to be this one. When 
x is equal to negative 2 min I can't spell minimum minimum that's when I find my absolute minimum so for the coordinate pair negative 2 comma negative 8 that is the absolute minimum of my function on this closed interval so notice this time my minimum didn't even my absolute minimum didn't even occur at a critical point it actually showed up on the starting point of my closed interval so be, just be aware that that's another thing you have to watch out for um, usually local maximum and local minimum appears at critical points but it could also appear at the endpoints if your function is only defined over a closed interval okay um, example two asks the question what is the maximum acceleration attained on the interval from 0 to 3 by the particle whose velocity is given by this function so remember acceleration as a function of time that's actually the derivative of velocity as a function of time remember acceleration is the rate of change of velocity over time and so whenever we say rate of change we're talking about derivatives and so this is sort of the relationship between acceleration and velocity. So if I want to write out my acceleration function, I just have to take the derivative of this velocity function. So I write 3t squared minus 6t plus 12. And again, I have this closed interval. So I have a beginning point 0 and an end point uh, 3. And I have to make sure that I try these before I conclude with my solution but what we're looking for is the maximum acceleration and so we're going to start by finding critical points and we ask what is the maximum acceleration so um, let's try this find critical points and remember critical points are places where the derivative is equal to zero so let's find the derivative of the acceleration function that's going to be 6t minus 6 and setting that equal to zero allows us to find the critical points by solving this one equation with my one unknown. And so that gives me 6t is equal to 6, or that t is equal to 1. This is my only critical point, t equals 1. And so I have to try this one as well. This is my critical point. And so I have a list of candidates that might be the absolute maximum acceleration so to try these out and find out which one actually is the maximum acceleration let's use my acceleration function evaluated at zero so that'll be three times zero squared minus six times zero plus twelve so this will just be z twelve um, next let's evaluate a of 3, since that's the other end point of my closed interval. And so I have 3 times 3 squared minus 6 times 3 plus 12. So that's uh, 3 times 9 is 27. Minus 6 times 3 is 18 plus 12. 27 minus 18 is 9. 9 plus 12 is 21. And then... Lastly, let's find the acceleration function evaluated at 1, because that was my critical point. And so this is going to be 3 times 1 squared minus 6 times 1 plus 12. So that's 3 minus 6 plus 12. That's going to be 9. And so out of my list of candidates, who had the best um, value? Right? who had the highest acceleration, because I'm looking for the maximum acceleration. So which acceleration was greatest? Was it when t equals 0 and I had an acceleration of 12? Was it when t equals 3 and I had an acceleration of 21? Or was it when t is equal to 1 and I had an acceleration of 9? Well, to me, this is kind of obvious. You know, the maximum is achieved whenever my t is equal to 3, and my acceleration took on a value of 21. 
So for the ordered pair t comma a, this has three comma 21 as my absolute maximum. And so this is my answer. Okay, that's two examples down. Let's do one more, maybe two more. We'll, we'll see how, we'll see how we feel. Um, let f be the function defined by this, natural log x divided by x. What is the absolute maximum value of f? So again, I'm looking for an absolute maximum. Um, if I wanna find the maximum, I need to find the critical points. And notice in this example, I did not define any closed interval. And so we don't have any endpoints to check. We only have to find the critical points and evaluate those. So the critical point is where you set the first derivative equal to zero. And the first derivative here, well, I'm gonna have to use the quotient rule over here. So let me write over here, quotient rule. So whenever I'm trying to take the derivative of natural log x divided by x, I'm gonna write this as f prime g minus f g prime over g squared, where f is my numerator, natural log, that means f prime is one over x, g is my denominator x, and so g prime is just one. So here, f prime g is um, one over x times x minus f g prime is natural log x times one divided by g squared, which is x squared. So x times one over x is just one, so I have one minus natural log x over x squared. That is the first derivative here. So asking what is the absolute maximum value of f, what we're asking is at what point is this derivative equal to zero? So I set one minus natural log x over x squared equal to zero. Now this derivative is only equal to zero if one minus natural log x is equal to zero. And so that is saying, give me the value of x where natural log x is equal to one. And if I take e to the left side and e to the right side, that tells me that x is equal to e. This is my critical point. Is it the absolute maximum value? of our function. That's sort of asking the question, you know, is this function concave up or concave down? Because if I have a concave down function, well then the critical point will be the maximum, which is what we want. But if I have a concave up function, then the critical point will be the minimum, which is not what we want. So maybe we should just double check and see what the concavity is. So here on Desmos, I've plotted the curve y equals natural log x over x. And if we put in our critical point, which is x equals e, that's how we find where the maximum value is. And notice even without this plotted, um, Desmos will still make a little dot where the maximum value is. And you can see that it's at 2.718, which you know is the first four digits of Euler's number. Um, for example, five, Let's try this. For what value of k will the function y equals x plus k over x have a relative maximum at x equals negative two? Well, for it to be a relative maximum, it has to occur at a critical point. Or at least that's a safe assumption to make. And we want that you know critical point to occur at x equals negative two. And so let's just calculate what that derivative would be. So derivative of y with respect to x here is gonna be one plus, and I can rewrite this function as k, x plus k times x to the negative one power. And so this lets me use the derivative power rule to make that one minus k times x to the negative two power. And the critical points are we, where we just set this derivative equal to zero, and then we solve for x. And so this is telling me that k of x squared should be equal to one. So x squared is gonna be one over k, and so x is gonna be square root of one over k, plus or minus. Now, that gives me two candidates 
one is positive square root 1 over k, and one is negative square root 1 over k. So that gives me two candidates for what might be the relative maximum because it gives me two uh, critical points. We have to figure out which one of these is a maximum. And to find out which one is a maximum, let's take the second derivative. And so derivative of one is just zero, and derivative here, I use the power rule, and that gives me positive two kx to the negative three power for the second derivative. And basically what we're saying is, oh, <laughs> the other thing is we, we want uh, our, our relative maximum or our critical points to happen at x equals negative two, right? And so if this is x equals plus or minus square root of one over k, then we're asking what value of k makes that x equal negative two. So let me think about this. Um, let's, let's start from here. I've sort of overdone it a little bit here. And sometimes that happens in math. You, uh, you know, you just try things, you see what happens, you see what you have left to work with, you see, you know, remind yourself every once in a while what you're actually trying to find. And here I have k times x squared equals 1. I want this maximum to happen when x is equal to negative 2. So let's make this k times negative 2 squared equals 1. So that's k times 4 equals 1. So that means k has to be 1 fourth in order for this to happen. And I'm curious. I'm curious because I'm still a little bit worried about that second derivative. I want the second derivative to be positive. No, 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 no. I want this to be negative because I want it to be concave down. And the, the curve will be concave down when the second derivative is negative. And when it's concave down, that's what gives me a relative maximum. So let's try plugging in our values for k and x into that second derivative formula. I get 2 times 1 fourth times negative 2 to the third power. So that's 1 half of negative 8. So that's negative 4. And it is negative. So that means with a negative second derivative, we have a concave down function and we do have a critical point. And so when it's concave down with a critical point, that's what gives me a relative maximum. And so this is the real solution here. Okay, it was a windy road, but eventually we got there. This was not so important. Got a little bit off track, because usually we're solving for x for critical points and not solving for k, which makes this example five a really interesting problem.